Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, okay. First of all, I'd like to thank Oda and, and Kate uh, for inviting me and taking such good care of me. I might get used to it. It's lovely. Um, and I guess the thing that was missing from the introduction is that I'm a peace activist. And that's so much a part of my identity that <laughs> there it is. Um, I was actually going to begin with a um, with uh, mentioning something that Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada said, but I think his image has been a bit tarnished recently. But I will uh, quote him anyway. When he was asked, as I'm sure you all know, when he was asked why he insisted on having 50% of his uh, cabinet to be gendered equality. He said um, simply uh, because it's 2015. And that's of course the case. But still, the truth is that here we are in this conference still asking why we don't have gender equality. And I think it's, I don't need to go into details or statistics, I think it's quite clear that in most countries, if not all countries, um, we do not have gender equality. And there have been, of course, many explanations for this, from the biological explanations of lions and tigers to the psychoanalytical, that you know, boys need to separate from the mother. Um, some explanations were found in the dichotomy of the public and private spheres, where women's place is in the private sphere, obviously, home, children. And by the way, in some religions, uh, that's considered a privilege, an honor. A woman is in the home, she's the queen, she's on a pedestal. Um, that's in fundamentalist Judaism. The, um, but this public-private dichotomy is that women are protected by the public sphere, they're protected by the men, but they also happen to be excluded from economic life, from business life, from politics, even from the arts. And of course, there have been exceptions over the centuries, but I think that we can still see that there are two levels, two levels of status, of opportunities, of expectations. And this is pretty much still with us. Um, and, of course, we still have many explanations for this. Feminists in the 20th century began to understand this as a situation or the result of patriarchy. Because most of us live in societies wherein the institutions and the norms have been created by men, according to their needs, their interests, their inclinations. And I don't think this is necessarily out of disdain for women or contempt for women. Um, I'm not even certain that it was intended to preserve their power, although some would argue that that was the reason. But circumstances were such that most societies were or have been shaped by men, and the result is patriarchy, namely priority for men entitlement, if you want to call it that, or at least the institutions and norms that suit men, mainly. And in many cases, these things aren't even seen or grasped as male-shaped uh, or oriented institutions. In many cases, these things, these norms, are in internalized and have been internalized for centuries even by women even by women, and viewed as natural, as totally natural. But in looking at all of this, I've been searching for one of the things that Hoda mentioned, of course, is how we change this situation. How can we achieve equality and break down the barriers that stand uh, before us and prevent gender equality? I acknowledge that equality um, is an ideal. It's, it's not necessarily a reality. Obviously not all men are equal. Uh, in most countries, there are many inequalities by class, by race, by religion, by ethnicity. Uh, even men are not all equal. 
but I do think that we can talk about a universal principle, a universal principle that is clearly enshrined in the system of democracy, a principle that entails equality before the law, equality of opportunities. And uh, in fact, what we get out of the Protestant Reformation in Europe is equality simply as human beings. In the revolutionary movements, the late 19th century, 20th century, revolutionary women tended to be universalists. Uh, anarchist Emma Goldman or uh, Marxist like Rosa Luxemburg, these social revolutionaries, they believed that revolution would end classes and with the end of classes you would have cre equality for everybody. Uh, the idea being that if there's no longer exploitation, everyone has the same relationship to production, we'll have equality, including gender equality. So although they did speak specifically of the rights of women, they did believe also that this would come as part of this overall redemption uh, and reorganization of society that would presumably benefit everybody. Of course, we have seen where that actually occurred, where there was a revolution, where there was a total reorganization of society, and the expected equality certainly didn't result. My first 20, 30 years in academia, I'm a Soviet specialist, uh, and I can assure you that the revolution did not bring equality. But if we look to the early feminists, the first wave of feminism in the late 19th century, early 20th century, especially if we look at the suffragettes, not all of them demanded the vote uh, or equality as uh, a matter of principle, the rights um, that go with democracy. Of course, many of them did, in fact, speak about the principle. Uh, but there were those who also said that women should have the vote because women would do things differently. They would clean up politics. That was one of the slogans. They were more moral than men. They would bring their qualities from home, their nurturing qualities into the public sphere, an ethics of caring. But whether they demanded rights in the name of democracy, that is rights, the principle of rights, or if they acted out of this claim that they would bring something better, something different. They, um, the idea was certainly to gain equality. They, I guess if we look from the perspective today, we would say they were liberal feminists. They were dealing with or advocating liberal feminism, basically saying, let us in, let us in. The way to break down the barriers was simply to join the existing institutions and to create equality from within. This, some people call this, you know, add women and mix kind of thing. Let us in, this was the idea. But I think the deeper analyses went further. And um, there are a few key phrases that, that I've sort of uh, grabbed onto in studying feminism. Groundbreaking statements, in my opinion. One of them was Cynthia Inlow's, where are the women? Where are the women? And she asks us to ask that question all the time. Are they invisible? Where are they? They weren't counted. You may remember, uh, I think it was Bem who said women were left out of statistics, in sociology, in medicine. Women weren't there. And of course, Cynthia Inlow was talking about it in terms of war. But the idea is women weren't in the picture. They were theoretically affected by what was going on. And they certainly weren't in the decision-making circles. And so that's one statement that stays with us. Where are the women? Where are the women? We have to ask that. The second one that I like is Carol Gilligan's In a Different Voice. 
Uh, she basically, in her work, was countering, trying to counter the claim by, uh, that was fairly prominent in psychology, that women were less moral than men. Um, she didn't say women were more moral. She said they were simply different, speak in a different voice, and that was what she brought. Women's experience is different from men. It's not, it's not necessarily better, it's not necessarily worse, but women may, in fact, bring something different. And um, that's, I think, another really very important thing uh, or, or insight that's, that's important in feminism. The third groundbreaker is from Catherine McKinnon, who's sort of something of my idol. In answer to the liberal approach, uh, where she was dealing, she's a law faculty, a law professor, she was dealing with uh, the labor code, where basically the idea was in, in employment, all things being equal, pick the woman. But she said, all things aren't equal. Our things, all things are not equal. We do not begin equally. It's not an even, an even playing field. All things are not equal. And we might call this uh, the beginning of, or the core of radical feminism. It looked at patriarchy and it said, we don't just join. You can't win there in their game. You have to change it. You have to change it. You have to counter patriarchy head on and rebuild society because we can't, we don't and can't compete equally in the society that they built according to their norms, their interests, their inclinations. I'll give you an example of this where it finally struck home. Not terribly long ago, about 20 years ago, um, a, younger, a young woman law professor where I was teaching, um, one time stopped me on the campus and said, you know, you didn't do us any favor. I didn't exactly understand what she meant. She said, you early feminists in Israel, um, you, you get, get this, we, are, we go out and we work and we can work in any profession, but you didn't change anything else. So we've got all that other stuff. We've got the double burden that I'm sure most of you know. You didn't change society. Society wasn't built for us. In Israel, the school day ends at one o'clock. What's a woman supposed to do? All kinds of things of this nature. Even transportation, public transportation. Women are the ones who mainly use tra public transportation. Is it organized according to their needs? This is the kind of thing that she pointed out. And it was sort of like you know, the, the bell, the, the, the light bulb up there. All of a sudden I realized that she was absolutely right. It wasn't just let us in, let us be professors, let us be doctors, whatever. We have to change society because society was not built for us. And so it's not just a matter of the legal system, the laws are important, but I'll give you a second example which comes home. We had a very famous case. We created a, a women's organization in 1984. And one of the things that we did was to bring a case to the Supreme Court in Israel. It's a famous case of Alice Miller. And this was a young woman who had a civil uh, pilot's license and she wanted to take, when she went her, her regular army service in Israel, she wanted to go into pilot training. They didn't let women into the pilot training course. They didn't have to take women into the Air Force as pilots in Israel. So we took it to the Supreme Court, and the court not only decided that, yes, she had the right to take the course, but the reason this case was so important was two. One is the judgment was on the basis of equality, the principle of equality. The second was they said the Army had to change. Okay, it's hard for you to accommodate a woman. You have to change. You have to change. You don't bring her into your system that doesn't really work well for a woman. And that's, that was, I think, the importance of that decision, at least for me. It was that we've got to change society and not just bring women in. 
Then a new challenge came in what we call the third wave of feminism, and that was an attack on essentialism. Not all women are the same. <laughs> As you mentioned, not all women are the same. There were different classes, races, ethnic groups, religious groups, not all the women are the same. And that's what we see today. We talk about intersectionality. Uh, I was once on a panel at the university, and one of the women was an Arab woman, a Palestinian citizen of Israel, and she explained a very interesting touch of intersectionality. She was a woman in Arab society where women were not on an equal level, and she was an Arab in Israel. So she was, as she put it, right there at the bottom. She was an Arab, which is bad enough if you're in Israel, and a minority, and within that minority, she was gender related. So we, uh, you in America know intersectionality probably better than most, uh, but certainly if you take a woman who lives in an area of conflict, in a militaristic society, a woman is going to be even more disadvantaged because the male, of course, has a certain position, entitlement that goes along with the position as the warrior, the protector, who may actually sacrifice his life for others. But another feminist thinker whom I like, although she's less known, is the late Susan Oaken. Accepting the idea, of course, not all women are the same. But what she pointed out was that in every class, every ethnic group, every whatever the group or category might be, women's experience is different from that of men. Maybe entirely different from a woman from another class or another race or another ethnic group, but in every one of these categories, in these groups in life, women's experience will be different from that of the man in the same category or the same group. Her point of view, where we stand, how we experience our day-to-day -day lives, the way we look at the things, all of these things will be different from the way in which the male experiences them or Carol Gilligan's in a different voice. It will be a gendered view somehow affected in this thing in terms of how we interact with the world. And so a feminist approach is one that breaks down a situation, an event, a law, and analyzes it from the point of view of relationships and of power relations. That's the essence of feminism. Where, where are we in this? Where am I in this? And this brings with it this breaking down this situation and looking at the power relations brings about, or can bring about in any case, sensitivity to the marginalized, to the what psychologists call outgroups, or maybe it's the sociologists who use that term, makes us sensitive to hierarchy. So Gloria Steinem said, it doesn't really matter if you call yourself a liberal feminist or a radical feminist, a radical feminist. What's important is this gendered view, this basic approach that looks at relations. It looks at power relations. By the way, this is one of the major contributions of feminism to modern philosophy. This, the idea of breaking down reality or situations and looking at gender relations, looking at power relations. And it's not only how to, it's not only a question of analyzing a situation with a gendered view, looking at power relations, but also how to deal with the situation, how to transform the situation. And here, I think from the earliest days, feminists looked at who's in power, who has the power in politics, in economics, in society, in the home as well, and of course in the world in time of war. So a strong element of the early feminists was anti-militarism, anti-war, and actually pacifism. Jane Addams and the women who came to The Hague to oppose World War I and created the Women's Peace Party 
They spoke in the name of advocated negotiations, mediation, nonviolence, but they connected it to a very basic factor. They connected it to their identity as women, arguing that war was a women, woman's worst enemy. War brings men to the center of things, uh, as the defenders, as the heroes, as the warriors. But they also are the decision makers in time of war, and I can tell you this from experience, in time of war, leadership, decision-making circles contract, so women are even more marginalized in a situation of war. But more than that, militarism, it could be argued, creates a sense of entitlement even for boys as the future saviors of the country, even if it's only implicit gives a sense of entitlement. It gives an added value to the male adult. His experience, his service, leads to a certain respect and privilege or advantage in society. It gives value to power, to strength, to the stereotypical male attributes. But it's not just the idea of qualities um, or attributes but it's also, if we look at it in time of conflict, the military, the military is a quintessence of patriarchy. It's based on hierarchy, it's based on orders, and commands, it's power over the use of force, it's power over. Hannah Arendt used to say the distinction was for men it's power over, for women power comes by working together. That was her take on it, but certainly militarism <coughs> The military institution itself is a quintessence of, high, of patriarchy. And militarism was seen by these early feminists as a major barrier to equality for women. And that's one of the reasons that they were pacifists. They were opposed to the exercise of power, to violence, to slavery, to male domination, to war. And the idea of conflict between genders or between nations. For them, the link between feminism and pacifism was not because women were peaceful by nature. Their pacifism was the result of everyday experience of oppression, of oppression, in opposition to any form of oppression. Now, there were those who did claim this in the name of uh, women being more peace-loving, in the name of motherhood. Women are mothers, they're nurturing, they seek harmony in the family. The more stereotypical uh, explanation, so to speak. And I think uh, we need to examine this. I think the, the importance of the stereotype and the way in which it does uh, determine much of our gender relationships, I think it is extremely important to look at. Um, we've had many discussions about the United Nations Resolution 1325, an extremely important resolution, trying to improve the situation of women by at least demanding that women have a role be brought into decision making that has to do with war and peace. But 1325, as much as feminists really worked very hard to get it, was based on three sort of justifications. One was the rights argument. Human rights, it's our right to be equal, to be part of this. The second, the second basis is we're the victims, or we are amongst the victims. Wars affect us. War and peace affect us, and so we should have a say. But the third justification was we should be part of the decision making because we bring something different. And the implication, at least was implied, is we bring something different, we're more peace loving. Well, in my opinion, this is the old stereotype at work again. We, this idea that we should be at the table because we are empathetic, we are caring, we are trustworthy, we're fair, 
we know how to cooperate. This is a very different way of looking at it. And research in the United States and in Western Europe did indeed see and has seen uh, a gap, a gender gap between when men and women when you come to questions of peace and war, the use of violence, the use of force, with women more than men being opposed to capital punishment, women more than men being opposed to war, specifically Vietnam, uh, Iraq, uh, women more than men being opposed to the use of force. By the way, this does not correspond necessarily with voting habits, um, at least not until the 1990s, but then voting habits also began to go in this direction of a gap. And the gap was usually explained by socialization. Uh, gender is socially constructed. Uh, girls are socialized to be more peace-loving, more what we call dovish uh, in their attitudes. So, okay, I studied all of that, and then I said, well, what happens in a society that's at war, a conflict society? conflict, armed conflict every so many years. What happens there where socialization in a militarized society, are we going to find the same gap? <coughs> and uh, I conducted a study with a colleague, Nomi Khazan, and then very recently there was another study. And it was puzzling. Uh, it was a study conducted uh, by uh, Professor Michal Shamir from Tel Aviv University. And she found, and she does really very serious work over the years, mainly voter studies, she found that women were more hawkish than men on certain issues. If you took the specific issues in our conflict, of borders, uh, security, the very, very nitty gritty of what would be, what's a contested in our, in our conflict. And she found that there was no gender gap as a matter of fact, most of the studies people tell you in Israel is no gender gap, no gender gap on these issues. Men and women comes out pretty much the same, hawkish. But when she asked people to put preferences in a hierarchy or list of priorities of values of democracy, peace, settlements, which is part of our situation, Jewish majority in the state of Israel, sort of what's important to you, women more than men put peace right at the top. Much more than men. Now this was startling. We don't know which was more startling, that women were hawkish on the issues, but put peace as the top priority, as distinct from men. Here there was a gap. We don't know why. We're still discussing this, and we have different ideas. I personally think it's a question of fear, where women feel less competent to control what's going to happen to them and therefore are more fearful of war and more in need of or seeking peace. But I, I, have, no, I have no explanation. But one thing does seem to be clear. If it's socialization, that may well account for the fact that on issues, men and women are in a conflict situation, militarized, socialized in a similar way. But What's more interesting for me, since we don't have the answers to, on the attitudes, is what happens, what about actions? What happens if women are in power? What happens if women are at the peace table? And we have some research on this. First of all, one of the things that happens, apparently, women in power is they adapt. Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher, they adapted. They adapted, they sort of took up, they were hardliners, they took up the hardline positions. We can have many explanations, psychological explanations as to why, if you want to go into politics, you have to do that. That was one thing. Another was they adopt a very interesting piece of research by a former student of ours, uh, Orna Sasson Levy, looked at women in the, in, in the military. She's an expert on this, and she found that women who went, in, who, who went into combat positions. We worked hard to get women into combat positions on that idea of joining, get in there. And what she found is when they, women got into these combat positions, they became like men. They lowered their voice, stood differently, 
they adopted male way of acting, even to the point of saying if somebody was doing something wrong, you call them a woman, you call them a girl, a sissy. They adopted. So that didn't seem to be the answer. And then we know that there are women perpetrators. Uh, in Rwanda there were, there are women terrorists. We know that there are women perpetrators. Um, and they, by the way, an interesting thing is even being in combat, we've seen with uh, Kurdish women, Eritrean women, um, Palestinian women, even when they have been warriors, they haven't changed anything. They go back to their communities and very often they're rejected because they've been corrupted by their experience out there. And by the way, the male commanders exclude them when it, in, in DDR, where they're deciding who's going to get what, they're demobilizing the warriors. Suddenly the women who were there aren't counted when it comes to the, the benefits that you're supposed to get or, uh, and so forth. So we find this, we find this almost everywhere in every, uh, every av avenue. Um, and so even if we reject this as a, a essentialist view, and it is clear that not all women are the same, but we do, I still ask, would it make a difference if women were at the table? Um, would it make a difference? And that's our 1325 again, which is really very important, I think. Now, there have been some very, very interesting, really thorough studies. The most uh, thorough study I've seen was done by the, here in the United States on the Council on Foreign Relations. And they did an enormous study on women and peace. It's, in, it's uh, on the internet. Um, they found something that you'll find in a lot, in a lot of pieces of research and that is that societies that have relative gender equality or gender harmony will have lower rates of violence and uh, lower possibilities of actual wars, whether they're internal or uh, state wars. High percentages of women in legislations, they found, will lead to fewer state conflicts. Um, they also found that if you have something like 35% of a parliament is women, you won't have a relapse of fighting. And this is, I think, one of the most important findings that they, uh, that they came up with, is that peace agreements lasted longer if you had women involved. Uh, and this was a study that they did from between 19, looking at all the conflicts between 1980 and 2003, and they found that this relationship between gender equality in the society led to a longer lasting peace agreement. Um, there was a study done, I think this one was by Miriam Anderson, of 181 peace agreements since 1989 when uh, women participated in the peace talks the agreements lasted longer. They lasted at least 15 years. So that's, and study after study showed this, which I think is amazing. That if women were at the table, the peace agreement lasted longer. So we look into why, and there are some explanations given here and there, and there's some that we can figure out. One of them is um, that women tend to be involved in, in civil society. Uh, which means they have grassroots connections. Um, and very often it means that they're a little bit more inclusive. They might even work with people across battle lines, so to speak. So in that sense, maybe one of the reasons these agreements last longer is that the women have these connections. A second is that women tend to bring issues of human security this distinction between hard security and soft security, or human security of the looking at the issues that, uh, that women are, are, are uh, absorbed in on a daily basis of food, getting food on the table, shelter, and so on. And if they are more inclined to look at these human security issues, they make sure that they are in the peace agreements. And if these issues are in the peace agreements, 
Perhaps that's one of the reasons that they last longer. And they found also that women, because they were involved in these peace talks and in these agreements, they had the, these connections, so to speak. Um, they also rendered the agreements a certain legitimacy. Um, they, they, you had fewer spoilers trying to spoil an agreement. Uh, we, don't, we don't know if these are the reasons that peace agreements last longer when women are at the table, but a number of researchers have proven this, have demonstrated this. Uh, there was one really fascinating piece of research that was done by a former colleague of mine, Ifat Maoz, looking at women at the table. And she took a group of Israeli men, and she presented a couple, many groups, four groups, and she presented them with a peace proposal for our conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. She presented a peace proposal. She told them it was presented by a man, Palestinian man, and it was generally rejected. She told them the same proposal was presented by a Palestinian woman, and it was accepted. And in questioning them, I guess she worked with students as sociologists tend to do, when she questioned them, why did you like this proposal that was presented by a Palestinian woman? Well, it seemed fair, trustworthy, the, all the stereotypical stuff. If it was brought by a woman, the stereotype came with it. Well, it must be fair, it must be uh, just. Uh, and this is mind boggling absolutely mind-boggling, in my opinion, that the stereotype is so strong that they would accept this proposal if it came, uh, if it, they thought it had come from a man. By the way, I have also heard, I was talked with uh, somebody who was involved in the negotiations in Colombia, their peace counselor, they had a, a, a governmental peace counselor, peace commissioner, and he said that actually uh, when the women's issues were brought in, didn't uh, work so well because it was adding a burden and made it harder to reach an agreement and some people in the public were opposed to having women's rights brought in there. But Marian Anderson, who's a, a young researcher, um, did find, she looked that when women were there, not only did she find the, what others had found that the peace agreements last longer, but they made a difference in the agreement itself. She looked at um, 195 agreements between 1975 and 2011, and she found that 40% of them, when women were at the table, 40% of them had clauses linked to the status of women and women's rights. And I, I raise this because Yes, we look to see if women are at the table, will it make a difference in how long a peace agreement lasts? But I also look to see, is this gonna help us in terms of women's rights? And she found that in 40% of the cases, women were there in the peace talks, there were, there were clauses in the peace agreement on the rights of women and the status of women, because women were there. But the whole, trick here, of course, is which women? Which women were at that table? If they were feminists, if they were feminists, then you got an advancement. You got some advancement of women's rights in that agreement or some effort to deal with the barriers that were holding women back and preventing equality in the past. And I did a bit of research. I compared legislatures in Israel over the years, and I looked at proposals, laws, proposals dealing with women's rights or in any way related to women's rights. And exactly the same thing came out. It wasn't how many women were in the Knesset or parliament at the time. It wasn't a question of numbers. It's not a question of numbers. I personally think it's a good thing to have lots of women elected. I think numbers are important so people, the public gets used to seeing women in these different positions. But that doesn't advance the cause. 
What advances the cause of equality is so they are feminists. And they might be men. They might be men. It was ideology. It was feminism. Whether it was a male or a woman, it was a question of who was putting the, the people who were putting forth these bills that affected the issue of equality positively were feminists. And so I always ask, it's not just numbers, it's which people, which woman are we putting there? Now, it may be more likely if it's a woman, because a woman does have this everyday experience, and in many cases it's an experience of oppression, an awareness, as Jane Addams saw it, and an awareness of oppression, an awareness of power relations, but that brings me back to a feminist perspective to make a difference. By the way, as an example of this possible connection, the Norwegian government gives, or at least it used to give, and well, it still had oil, uh, a good deal of foreign aid. And when it gives foreign aid, I found, it links it to a demand. It conditions it on a demand for gender reform, that certain legislation be passed. If you want our aid in, in, in many countries, this is the demand. Nor the Norwegians make the demand. Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, she not only created a new position at the State Department as the advisor on women's issues, every time she met with a world leader all over the world, she brought up the issue of gender equality, gender relations. And today we have a Swedish foreign minister who's a feminist um, and talks about a feminist foreign policy. We have to see, it's interesting to see what she does with it. So, uh, good old Trudeau who says, yes, half of his cabinet should be women. Of course half a cabinet should be women in terms of the principles of human rights, of democracy, of equality. But I have to add every time, which women? Who are we bringing in? Uh, it's not biology. It's not biology. It's a consciousness of power relations. It's a consciousness of what, what is at stake. And this is, uh, this is I think, the, the crucial matter. I, I don't know that we can always ask this, but I think that uh, for myself, I believe that whether it's a man or a woman, I think there is a tendency for a woman to be more likely to be aware of these things, of to break down a situation and look at it, simply because of our daily existence, but it could also be a man. But what it is, is feminism. It's looking at the world, looking at our day-to-day -day reality in a different way. And I think this is what brings the difference of a woman at the table and a woman at the peace talks and a woman in a peace agreement. Thank you.